ousted for not writing enough traffic tickets. Tonight, Morrison's former police chief sits down with Denver 7 as a city memo details why he was forced to resign. The first lady makes her pitch to the country. The people in this administration are here fighting for you. Donald Trump has not and will not lose focus on you. Night two of the Republican National Convention is in the books. Tonight, we continue our 360 coverage. And the incredible show of support in a small Colorado town. Residents come together to save struggling businesses. My golly, it's just the best. Well, you've likely heard it before. Cops need to make their speeding ticket quota. Well, it turns out it may have more truth than we thought. The police chief in Morrison was just forced to retire in part because his department didn't write enough tickets. Denver 7's Gary Broad sat down with the chief to hear his story. George Mama is on a one-way trip to retirement. I would never have driven it through Morrison. Giving him plenty of time to hit the open road. Although this extra free time comes a little sooner than the 64 year old may have liked. I think I'd have probably done a few more years here um, was the original plan. Mama spent the last two and a half years as Morrison's chief of police, a small town of about 400 people with a big reputation. Speed trap. The officers only wrote tickets. And quite frankly, that's pretty much the truth. But since he took over, Mama worked to turn that reputation around. And that also meant less tickets and in turn, less town revenue. I've never worked for an agency till now where riding traffic tickets is the entire police department. My bad going in um, and thinking that we could change that. Mama says he's had conversations in the past with the town manager to write more speeding tickets. COVID hit and then there was no traffic. With no traffic, there are no tickets. Denver 7 reached out to the town manager, Kara Winters, about why he was let go she told us the town of Morrison doesn't comment on personnel matters. Denver 7 obtained a memo to the Morrison Police Department. In it, Winters writes she and Mama disagreed on officers wearing masks while in public and that the two were not aligned with respect to the board's mandate that the department more effectively control traffic speeds and vehicle noise throughout the town. I'm kind of surprised though because Morrison got such a bad rep for being a speed trap and then someone tried to make it better and then they're firing him for it. It's been a great run. Mama's biggest regret, leaving his officers too soon. And really it's just a difference of opinion. I have an ethical stand that I'm willing to take and I'm not willing to bend on it. As he rides off into the next chapter of his life. In Morrison, Gary Brode, Denver 7. In the last 90 minutes, RTD announced a finalist to take over as the new general manager and CEO of the transit agency. Deborah Johnson has 25 years of experience within public transit. She's coming from Southern California, where she's deputy CEO of Long Beach Transit. First Lady Melania Trump headlines tonight's Republican National Convention. And tonight, for the first time in modern American history, the nation's top diplomat speaks at a political convention. We are continuing our 360 coverage tonight. Chief Investigator Tony Kowaleski has a look back at night two of the RNC. Our party's theme tonight is America, the land of opportunity. The night included many average Americans sending messages about how their lives are better because of President Trump. And he supports a process that seeks and respects fishermen's views. As long as Trump is president, fishing families like mine will have a voice. Our entire economy and dairy farming are once again roaring back. One person deserves the credit and our vote. President Donald J. Trump. I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. The night also included two rather unusual events for a convention. First, the president pardoned a Nevada bank robber who has turned his life around. And viewers also watched as the president witnessed a White House naturalization ceremony. You are now fellow citizens of the greatest nation on the face of God's earth. Congratulations. The president also received a strong endorsement from Kentucky's attorney general. I believe Donald Trump can meet Lincoln's mandate, even as Joe Biden remains trapped by his own failed record and by the radicals who dominate his party. The secretary of state provided the president's global report card from Jerusalem, 
a move criticized by national media. Because President Trump has put his America First vision into action. It may not have made him popular in every foreign capital, but it's worked. The night's featured speaker, First Lady Melania Trump, live from the Rose Garden. I'm here because we need my husband to be our president and commander in chief for four more years. He's what is best for our country. Our 360 perspective includes a look inside the TV ratings. Numbers out on Monday show there were more people watching night one of the Democratic convention than Monday night's Republican convention. Take a look. Opening night of the RNC drew an average of 15.9 million viewers. A week before, the DNC drew an average of 18.7 million viewers, a difference of about 3 million viewers, leaving Republicans with a challenge for night two. I believe that we need my husband's leadership now more than ever in order to bring us back once again to the greatest economy and the strongest country ever known. Now, critics of night two of the convention said many of the speakers were loose with their facts and strong on rhetoric. Republican supporters again say the night was successful because the convention continues to appeal to the president's base and the party believes that base will ultimately determine this election. And Tony, thank you. And our 360 coverage continues with Democratic State Senator Julie Gonzalez. After tonight's live coverage, she told us voters are desperate for healing, unity and solutions. And she says she has seen none of that at this convention. There literally is no Republican platform. They say um, we have no policy agenda. We have no ideas. Um, we're just going to do whatever Donald Trump says. And um, I think it shows. And Gonzalez says the White House immigration ceremony shown during the convention was a shameful example of the president playing politics with other people's lives. So what exactly is Trump's path to victory here? Well, he has to win the same states he won in 2016. But if you look at the polls, it's not necessarily going to be easy. And now President Trump is eyeing some states that Hillary Clinton won four years ago. So speeches this week at the RNC are targeting voters in Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Florida, Texas, Arizona, and Pennsylvania, all swing states that went red four years ago. But polls indicate each state there potentially could turn blue. The president is also investing in states that Hillary Clinton won in 2016, including Colorado and Nevada, states that lean blue. But the biggest target for Republicans this time around is Minnesota. Republicans have not won there since 1972, but last time around, Trump came awfully close. In 2016, President Trump spent just $30,000 there. He's expected to spend more than $10 million in that state this year. And tomorrow marks Women's Equality Day, a day to commemorate the day the 19th Amendment was officially proclaimed law, giving women in the U.S. the right to vote. According to the Pew Research Center, women have outnumbered men in voting in every presidential election since 1984. Most recently in 2016, 63% of eligible women voted, compared to 59% of men. We will continue our 360 coverage tomorrow on Denver 7 News at 10. On night three of the RNC, we expect to hear from Vice President Mike Pence and the second lady, along with Kellyanne Conway and two former NFL players. Well, Colorado was set to ask voters in November to approve a statewide family and medical paid leave program. If this is approved, the measure would allow for up to 12 weeks of paid leave for millions of Coloradans starting in 2023. Employers and their employees would have to pay around 0.45% of employee wages or the employer can cover 100% of the cost. Now, companies that offer private plans can opt out and businesses with 10 or fewer employees wouldn't have to pay the fees. Now, lawmakers have tried but failed to pass a similar mandate for years. Thornton police are searching for the driver involved in a deadly crash on I-25. We brought you this story's breaking news last night on Denver 7 News at 10. Police say a motorcyclist was hit by a black pickup truck on I-25 between 120th and 136th. Now, police don't have a license plate number. They don't even have a make and model at this point. They say that truck might have damage to the passenger side quarter panel. And police are hoping that someone saw something and calls them. The University of Northern Colorado is investigating what it's calling a hate crime that happened over the weekend, but police are disputing that claim, saying a motive is still unclear. Police say someone was assaulted off campus at a party off 8th Avenue west of Highway 85 early Saturday morning. UNC officials say the student was targeted because of the color of their skin. 
Greeley police say they are still investigating. The city of Denver wants the people who damaged city and private property over the weekend or on any protest to date to pay in the form of restitution. I suppose if the evidence were there and of a crime and, and we were able to capture that and form the basis for a case, we would. So we're told the city's already paid about $1.3 million to repair the damage from protests and demonstrations in downtown Denver so far. And then after this weekend's destructive protest, the city says that could go up to $4 million.